Hey, welcome everybody. We are back. We are back with the We Fix Pain podcast, number 16, with Dr. Dimitri Asimakopoulos. Yes, I use my Greek accent. My mom is no longer rolling around in her grave and that private school tuition. Mom, it was worth it just for that. that. The topic of today is what's the deal with chronic pain? Um, doc, Dr. Asimakopoulos is a chronic pain expert. He teaches lectures and courses all across the great country of Canada, our friendly nor, uh, northern neighbors. Um, Let me introduce this podcast. This podcast focuses on health and wellness related topics with a specific emphasis in integrated neuromusculoskeletal care. We discuss injuries to muscles, tendons, ligaments, joints, fascia, bones, and nerves that lead to pain. We address topics on this podcast like assessment, diagnosis, treatment, rehab, and management of acute and chronic related pain conditions. We'd like to thank our listeners and our guests for listening and watching our podcast. We're up on Spotify, Anchor, and on YouTube. On Spotify and Anchor, it's the We Fix Pain podcast. On YouTube, it's under my name, Dr. Dino Pappas. We humbly ask, if you like this podcast, please subscribe and share. Let me do a quick introduction of Dr. Dimitri here for for the folks. He's the senior chiropractor for interdisciplinary pain, for the interdisciplinary pain program at the Pain and Wellness Center and he's a senior chiropractor for Comprehensive Integrated uh, Pain Program Rehabilitation Pain Service at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. He works alongside a multidisciplinary team in both locations of physicians and allied healthcare professionals to diagnose and manage chronic pain. In his role, he provides manual therapy, acupuncture, and goal-focused rehabilitation. In addition to that, he's a guest lecturer for the CMCC, that's the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College Graduate Studies Program, where he teaches a 20-hour course on chronic pain diagnosis and management. He also teaches chronic pain diagnosis and management workshops all throughout the great country, our northern neighbors of Canada. Some other little tidbits of information. He's a graduate of 2012 of CMCC, Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College. He obtained a uh, specialty certification from McMaster's University Medical Acupuncture Program, which I believe is one of the most rigorous acupuncture programs out there. And yes, I've screened it and vetted it. If I decided to do that, that's the one I would do. And he's a diplomat in pain management of the Canadian Academy of Pain Management. In addition to that, when he does have free time, he volunteers sideline emergency care first responders for the Whitby. I say that right? Yeah. Would be Rush Women's Box Lacrosse Team, and for the Toronto Titans Men's Football Team uh, from 2012 to 2014. Doctor, you're a busy guy. Thank you for coming on. Uh, it's a it's a real honor and a pleasure. Uh, you know, thank you so much for having me on. I uh, I was really excited when when you sent me the message to to be part of this podcast, and uh, you and I have. Uh, have chatted multiple times online. So now I'm getting the great pleasure of sitting you down and having a nice conversation. So thanks. Well, Doc, I'm honored that you join us and uh, I appreciate your time because crack pain sucks in any way that we can slice it for patients, for our community, for our providers that listen to this podcast, we can help uh, progress our knowledge on that. We, we're doing our communities a service. So thank you for your time and in advance, thank you for sharing what you have because Admittedly, even I, I need up my game in this area too. So, Doc, what's your superhero origin story? How'd you end up in healthcare as a chiropractor? And then, Part B, how'd you decide chronic pain was going to be your niche? I uh, I actually really love this question because it, it takes me back. And I was sitting at <clears throat> pardon me, I was sitting at breakfast this morning, my Saturday morning breakfast with my uh, my mom and my brother. Um, and I, I knew this question was coming, so I actually shared the story with my brother because it's his fault. Uh, so, <laughs> older uh, brother or younger brother? Uh, older brother. He's nine years older than me, so uh, it's absolutely his fault. Then, absolutely his fault. So, but in, a good <laughs> way, in, a, in a really good way. So, when I was in either late high school or early university, um, my brother came home one day after working on a construction site he, for a long time. He was a tradesperson, and uh, he came in with just an insanely sore back. And he and I both used to work out at this local gym down the street from us. And there was a chiropractor there and I knew him, like we knew each other by first name. I didn't really know what a chiropractor did or does at the time. And um, so I called up my, my buddy back then and I said, can you get my brother in? He's, he's in a lot of pain. And 
I couldn't go because I was studying. So he goes in, he gets a treatment. My brother comes home, just right as rain, no pain at all. Just after a single treatment, his pain went away. And at the time I was, I was really into fitness. I think I was early in university, if I remember now. Um, and I was studying kinesiology and I knew that I wanted to pursue something there, but I always loved uh, everything having to do with injury. And then I thought, you know, I, I got to become a chiropractor. Like this, this is where I got to go because if chiropractors can have this measure of effect on people, just seeing them for a short amount of time, then I think that's perfect for me. So that's why I credit my brother for this. It's his fault, but yeah, tongue in cheek, tongue in cheek. Like an older brother, right? He, he just dragged you along for the ride there. You really did. You really did. And the, the, the second part of your question is how did I, how did I fall into this niche of, of chronic pain? Well, there is, there is no specialty in pain, in pain management uh, for chiropractors in Canada. I'm really not sure if there is one in the United States. So I'm not a specialist per se. Um, I really just have a focused practice. And I, I entered private practice after graduating in 2012 in the standard uh, kind of family practice uh, here in Toronto. And then this opportunity to join a hospital program kind of fell into my lap. So a couple of my buddies um, put me in touch with the then director of, of the pain program that I work at at the hospital. Her uh, clinical coordinator was um, retiring at the time, and she wanted to move into having a chiropractor fill that role because her clinical coordinator couldn't physically examine patients. They were a trained physician, but they didn't have a license in Canada. So they mm. wanted to offload that burden and, and, and have uh, open up their time a little bit to, to do other things. So I applied for the position, sat in, did observations, asked the right questions, came in very humble. And then I was given the gift of joining this hospital team at the Toronto Western and then we moved to Toronto Rehab. Um, that same director then left our program um, and it was taken over by uh, a new physiatrist and she opened up this, um, sorry, the, the old director opened up this new program in the community called the Pain and Wellness Center. And we're one of the, I, I think we're the only community-based program in Ontario, the province of Ontario, that uh, actually has government funding that will give patients oh, wow. the ability to go through our program, uh, an inter whole interdisciplinary uh, program for three months. I believe it's about 60 to 80 hours, if I remember correctly. Um, and if they're a suitable candidate, they're, they're given all that, all those hours for free. Is uh, the chronic pain problem in Canada such that the, the government is looking for solutions because the burden to the country, the community, the province is so great that we'll fund you guys because if you have something that can help us, we can try to scale it elsewhere? Was that, was that the thought? Yeah, so... The, the government of Canada has actually been very interested in, in this pain problem. I mean, similar to, I believe, the United States or to the rest of the world, about 20 to 25 percent of, uh, of people in Canada suffer from chronic pain at any point in time. So um, and it costs a lot of money. So it's it's not nearly the same volume as the United States, because I believe you guys have double or, or probably triple our population. Um, but we, um, the, the costs are still really, really high. So they've invested a lot of money, both provincially and federally, in order to um, create infrastructure for chronic pain. Now, healthcare, we have uh, socialized medicine in Canada. So uh, healthcare is a provincial jurisdiction. So one thing that has happened in the last uh, number of years is that the province of Ontario has become very interested in helping to manage this this pain problem uh, that we're all having, both acute and chronic, but the, the biggest bulk of the management or the funding has gone towards chronic pain management. So they have funded um, numerous sites, both in the adult um, uh, age group and in, in, the, in the children's age group to help manage chronic pain better. And we at the Pain and Wellness Center uh, are the only community-based program out there uh, that has this kind of funding 
so I have one foot there and then I have mm. the other foot in, in the hospital based program in downtown Toronto. Uh, so yeah, a lot so you've of got a unique new unique perspective you've got hospital based maybe different demographic of patients but chronic pain nonetheless and community based maybe slightly different demographic but chronic pain nice nonetheless so you can kind of see from this lens and this lens the scope of the of the problem yeah it's very it's very cool the demographically the populations are very different <clears throat> in the in in the downtown core uh, there's uh, the, the population is much different and we've actually published these data about how these two populations are actually very, very different uh, in the community and in the, um, and the hospital based programs. For instance, in the community, I think that this, this is a, a product of where we are in, in the province of Ontario. There's a large um, European Caucasian influence as opposed to it's a little bit more multicultural in the downtown core. Are far more opioid users in the downtown core compared to where we are in um, in uh, just outside of the city. Um, so yeah, there are very distinct features that define our clinical populations in each area. Interesting, um, Doc. Uh, we're going to move on with the intro to the core of the uh, conversation. And it's interesting to hear the uh, you know your your journey and then how you have these two unique practices and demographics with unique challenges to each. Uh, the get to know you phase for people that don't know you. And, uh, you know, again, this will be fun for, for you and for me here as well. So I'm going to do five fun random questions. Uh, I like to add a human side to these podcasts and the five fun random questions off the top of my head, just coming in, whatever's coming is what you're going to get. So the person you like to have dinner with the most. Oh, man. I, like on a professional level, on a personal level. You name it, you pick it. Do they have to be alive or like any time in history? No nope. time machine. Wide open. It's wide open. It's whoever you want to have dinner with. No restrictions. You can go anywhere, any point in time. It could be current day. It could be family. It could be celebrity. You name it. Man, <clears throat> I mean, I. You're, you're you're Greek. I'm Greek. Like I uh, I love having dinner with family. So anybody anybody in my immediate family would be would be number one. But if I could pick any anybody outside of my family first, man, I'd have to say Oliver Sacks. Hmm. Interesting. Why? Oliver Sacks. Uh, so first of all, my the. The, the former director of our of our program downtown and the current director of our interdisciplinary program in the community uh, wrote a book called Beyond Pain. And um, mm. throughout the throughout the uh, decade, she's actually described this one phenomenon called a non dermatomal somatosensory deficit, which is essentially um, uh, big words, Doc. You got to break it down for us. Yeah. So so it's essentially a. I don't want to nerd out too hard, but it's a it's essentially uh, a sensory alteration. So an area of skin that has altered sensation that's not within the confines of a, uh, of a known anatomical, like neuroanatomical structure, like a, a dermatome or a peripheral nerve territory. Uh, so it's outside the confines of what has actually been mapped out in terms of, um, in terms of sensation mapping. And um, when she published her book, uh, and then after, after publishing numerous articles on this very topic, Dr. Sachs reached out to her and said, I've been trying to figure this out because I studied this particular phenomenon, this particular phenomenon happened to me, and they developed a very good friendship. And Dr. Sachs wrote the foreword to her book. Even before yeah. that, even when I was in high school, I, uh, I read um, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Um, I... Um, and, and numerous others of his books. I have River of Consciousness just sitting on my nightstand right now. Uh, gratitude, the same thing. And he, the one thing I loved about, or I love about Dr. Sachs is that he's such a keen observer of behavior and of people. And he notices things that people don't notice. <laughs> he is, in terms of medicine, he is the he's the best detective I've ever seen in, in, in real life. Like who's not like house, for instance. Right. 
But at the same time, he was such a science renaissance man. He would be able to speak confidently about evolution and geology and chemistry and, and, and history and, and you name it. And he was able to synthesize all this amazing information with his personal experiences in his life. And um, I would love to sit down and just listen to him speak and pick his brain and have him teach me or offer me advice about how to be the best clinician I could be based on, based on what he's experienced. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. I have to be all over staff. That's, yeah, it's a unique skill, man. Taking and synthesizing information and detaching, backing up so that you can process truly what's going on in you. Cause sometimes we all get too involved in it. We take a step back. It's quite a different view. All right, doc, what's your happy place? Oh, Question man. two. That's, that's easy. I mean, at home with my wife and son, uh, uh, I've been actually celebrating my 10 year wedding anniversary this year. Congrats. And, Congrats. Uh, thank you. We have the most beautiful three year old son as well. And, uh, just sitting at home and hanging out with those guys is, is the best feeling in the world to me. Does he have his first pair of hockey skates yet? <laughs> no, you know what, because of COVID and because of all, and because of just how busy we are, we haven't gotten him on ice yet. Um, he's not the most coordinated kid, I have to say. <laughs> Never mind standing on skates. He'll, he'll bump into a wall. <laughs> it's just rounding a corner. So I'm a little bit scared about his athletic prowess. Yeah. Um, all right, question three. The book you'd recommend to somebody to read twice? Oh, man. Uh, and, and tell me, professional, like uh, – is, you name it. I've got there? something. I, there's one. I'll, I'll, I'll go first here. So um, the pr book I tell somebody to read twice. Uh, I read this book and it changed my life. I reread it a second and the aha moments just kept coming. It's called Extreme Ownership. It talks about mindset, how to own any situation. And a lot of times when you shift the blame to somebody else, look inwards. What did I do wrong? You know, like my daughter isn't doing her homework. Well, maybe I didn't explain to her the importance of doing her homework today. Or maybe I didn't give her a routine that's good enough so she can do her homework in a specific routine. Or did I break the routine and throw her off her routine? So owning that situation, the very mindset of ownership. So I don't recommend you read it once. I think you're scratching the surface. I recommend you read it twice. Right. That's that's great. Um, so I'll give you I'll, I'll give you a, I can't choose between two. So I'll. I'll give you two, one professional and one, um, one non-professional. Or um, So the first one would be uh, A World of Hurt by uh, Melissa Kolsky and Annie O'Connor. That's probably my one. Great one. Great one, great one, great one. Yeah. That, that book has influenced me so much in my career. And I, I, I credit um, our, our colleague, Tom Lotus, and, and Annie, who I've met um, and talked to on a few occasions for, for exposing me to that. Another one is a relatively new one by an author by the name of Rene Rodriguez called Amplify Your Influence. So really, it's just about it's just about how to ethically gain influence when you're in situations um, such as this one where you're trying to communicate with people. How do you enhance your communication abilities in order to incite influence in a positive way? So it's not about manipulation. It's really just about creating the, the infrastructure for influence. And I really enjoyed that one. Yeah, and you're right. Man, trying to manipulate somebody for uh, your purposes is selfish and it's counterproductive. Building the relationship and uh, foundation of mutual exchange where each person benefits is, is where the magic's at. Yeah, and it's it, it really is magic when you learn how to do these things and even implementing little things. Uh, so, yeah, that, that would be um, Last two two questions here, real quick, uh, and then we'll get on to the, the the topic at hand a little bit more. Patient gift. Somebody, your patient has given you a gift. The most memorable one. Somebody has given you to say thank you. What what step in so far for you in your career? Oh man, so I have the luxury of being able to spend a lot of time with my patients, and they we get to know each other really well. So people give me really personal gifts, um, and um, one patient got to know me so well, she would ask me 
she would ask me what socks I'm wearing that day and she would want to see them <laughs> because I always wear funky socks. I don't think I have a standard pair. And uh, she got me the most beautiful socks for Christmas this past year. Nice. It really nice. Warmed my heart. She knew me really well. You, you, you need them up in Toronto up there. You need two of them, actually, double socks. I'm wearing my fuzzy socks right now. So. That's it. That's it. All right, last major question. Uh, what's the blank moment in healthcare? Like when a patient says something, you're like, what did you just say? What the blank moment in healthcare? So there's the, the the thing that I see a little bit more often than the standard clinician, just based upon the population I see, are people come to us very, like, really, really vulnerable. So people share with me a lot of really deep things. So, and people have told me that they're 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 going to take their own life. That's that's happened on more Ooh. than one occasion. Um, and those those are the what the bleep moments for me because it's just like okay, I'm kind of deer in headlights for a second. And I remember one of the first times this happened to me, I was sitting with my resident, uh, all the residents at the, at the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College do a three month rotation with me at the hospital. My resident was in there with me. And this patient said like, she had CRPS and she had to, she's just like, you gotta get me better um, or else I'm not gonna be here very long. And oh, know, man. Um, yeah, we kind of mind that. And the resident had to leave like she and she was just she had to go home because she was so upset. Um, so yeah, she was shook. Yeah, that that's happened to me numerous times. Um, and it's never easy. It never gets easier. No, no, it's uh, for somebody to admit that to you. There's there's things going on and they're not too far off from executing at that point. Um, yeah, just it, it's a slippery slope that moves quickly. Yeah, I've had that happen to me once and, uh, uh, you know, patient um, years ago, this is the early parts of the opioid em- epidemic. We didn't know we were in it until you look back a couple of years. And he told me that today I'm going to go home and uh, I'm going to shoot my wife and shoot myself. And uh, he was all, all jacked up on opioids and he was in a work conditioning, work hardening program. And uh, we um, like literally kept making his program that day longer and longer and longer so that he could come down. And then at the end of it, he's like, I'm be tired. And I'm like, you go in that treatment room and you sleep and take a nap. It's all yours the rest of the day. And then I made the appropriate phone calls that day. And uh, I you know, called the cops. I'm like, he said it. You may want to get somebody to the house to protect her. And then I called his physician. I was like, you, you got to do something. He has uh, said something to me that's very private, very personal. And I, I think the medication is really impacting him. And that was, that's when, you know, in 2004, when it started to hit me, like these, these are not games. These are not toys. You may be prescribing them like candy, but, you know, uh, you, you, this is the inevitable consequence. I do have one that's not so gloomy. I had a patient that was legit, legit thought his sacrum was a scrotum. He called every time he pointed to the sacrum, he said scrotum. And he's like, and I just ignored it. And then he's just like, you know, uh, he called me, be- he called me a couple weeks later because he was work personal injury workers compensation. And then he's like, you have your notes wrong. Cause I didn't have the heart to tell him. Like he was like so sure. And I was like, fine, we'll, we'll, we'll roll with it. And he's like, you have your notes wrong. When I went to this doctor, he told me that I have a sacrum problem and, and your notes say sacrum, but it's clearly my scrotum. And I was like, no, I just didn't have to heart tell you because you were sure, but it is really a, just a sacrum. And he still refused to believe the neurosurgeon and myself. One of those guys are just convinced, like, you're like, fine. So I, I just ducked it and moved, but I probably should have dropped a little hint in there because he came yelling at me that I got it wrong in my clinical notes. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a really amazing story. I had, I had one patient who I still see to this day who, who broke his penis <laughs> and then and then he developed like widespread pain afterward <laughs> so that was just like excuse me <laughs> yeah <laughs> like i need to step out i'm professional but i need to step out for a second and process this all right uh that being said doc what is chronic pain we've we've done a, a bunch of fun stuff let's get to this topic here what is chronic pain so that that's actually a very loaded question um 
that, that requires just a smidge of background. Now, the definition of chronic pain previously was pain that persisted longer than three to six months that was past the duration of normal healing time. Um, and with that came this notion of something like chronic pain syndrome, whereby if you don't have like a peripheral nociceptive driver, then you have, you're either centrally sensitized or it's a psychological or psychiatric disease. So it fell within the realm of the DSM-5. <clears throat> in, in, in the latest iteration, however, of the international uh, classification of diseases, 11th edition, so the ICD-11, that definition that persisted for many years was actually redefined only to a temporal duration based um, um, uh, definition. So it's just pain that lasts longer than three months. And the reason why they change that is because there can be pain conditions out there like neuropathic pain or uh, painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy or um, post-stroke pain, uh, something like that, that are actually true uh, pathologies that are irreversible, that the person might continue to, to uh, experience pain from. Um, so there is, there's nothing about healing time there. There's nothing about psychological disease or psychiatric disease there. It just, it just is. Uh, so because of that, they, they thought to redefine it. Now, um, the, the ICD-11 also subcategorized chronic pain into two distinct categories. The first is chronic primary pain whereby the pain is the disease itself. So it's a disease in and of itself. So there's no peripheral cause, or if there might be a peripheral cause, it's not, it's not enough to define or explain what the person's experience of pain is. So the pain is the underlying condition that needs to be treated itself. Whereas chronic secondary pain is where pain is a feature of a particular disorder. So like it's chronic secondary musculoskeletal pain, neuropathic pain, post-traumatic um, uh, post or post-surgical pain, cancer pain, things like that. How much of that would you say is primary and how much of that would you say is secondary? Because I almost feel like primary is, I don't want to say a cop-out diagnosis. Have you really started to peel back the layers enough to find a cause? And I'm not just talking about a purely musculoskeletal um, cause, but, you know, the psychiatric component or, you know, you have an au underlying autoimmune disease and we haven't gone down the rabbit hole to find what that is. So how much of it pain in that ICD-11 is truly like we're just treating the pain versus the secondary? We need to keep diving down that rabbit hole. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, nobody actually knows the answer to that question because the ICD-11 only recently came out. And the, the reason why they- We don't use it here. We're on still on 10. Yeah, it won't trickle down. Actually, we, the director of our program recently published a narrative review that, and part of it actually discussed how long the trickle down time uh, is between the release of a, a new iteration of the ICD and actually it being used in clinical practice. And it's it's a, an extremely long time before it's actually used in practice. Uh, like 20 of, years, right? Yeah, it's decades. Um, yeah. And the, which sucks, but it is what it is. So the, the reason why, one of the reasons why they develop these two parent categories with the subclassifications therein um, is in order for them to ask and answer that particular question. So scientists, if everyone's speaking the same language, then they can count the number of beans coming from each, uh, each area. So that way they can develop better models of epidemiology in order to predict that. Um, the, the, the issue I think that you touched on there is very important is, is the clinician at the grassroots, I don't wanna say good enough, but do they have the knowledge to be able to, to, to determine, okay, this is truly not a secondary phenomenon, this is a primary phenomenon, and they've ruled out all the, all the possible diagnoses that might explain this patient's pain condition from a secondary perspective. Um, so th there's no good answer to that. 
Uh, me as a clinician, I, I have found that my, my general rule is I'm going to stick to a secondary cause until proven otherwise. Right. And, and there are no, the, the internet, the international association for the study of pain has come up with, um, uh, mechanistic descriptors and key factors that might allow a clinician to determine which mechanistic descriptor a patient might fall into, but even that needs more study. So the, the answer is kind of not there yet. Yeah, it's a work in progress. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we'll get some of those answers pretty soon because there's a bunch of people out there that, that probably could benefit from those answers. Um, how does one person start to make the transition? I, I think it's easy for folks to conceptualize, patients in particular, uh, providers to some degree. I have this acute ankle sprain or this acute um, rotator cuff injury. And, you know, this rotator cuff injury or this ankle sprain, there's things that drive this problem. But one year later, why is this ankle still bothering me? Why is the shoulder still bothering me? So how does one start to make the transition from acute injury to chronic pain? Uh, that's a very layered question as well. So, I mean, was it, was it, adequately, di was it adequately diagnosed and treated? Right? So that's, that's my first question uh, overall. So we know that tendinopathies can be persistent with a, a lateral ankle sprain, for instance, do they have a, a, an osteochondritis desiccans or do they have a, a, an unhealed condylar fracture or something like that that's creating persistent pain or is it unstable now? So there, there are a bunch of peripheral like anatomical factors that we want to rule out uh, from a tissue perspective. Um, so maybe that person just needs to be gradually loaded and exposed in order to um, enable optimal healing. Um, and I use the word optimal healing as a, uh, as a loose descriptor, um, simply because it could be that healing has happened, but there's still a persistent nociceptive bombardment that hasn't been, um, addressed yet from, from some perspective. So can we, can we identify the persistent nociceptive driver that is, that is keeping this? There's also the case of misdiagnosis. So was it, um, so for instance, I saw one patient who had uh, Achilles tendinopathy um, and they were seen by um, multiple physicians and physiotherapists who kept diagnosing them with Achilles tendinopathy. And then finally they came in to see me and I was just like, well, no, it's a sural neuropathy. Like there's an actual neurological disease here. So there's this thing of, uh, misdiagnosis. Uh, but not to mention, there are numerous psychological um, and cognitive factors that can, and neurobiological factors that can lead to, to persistent pain. So um, uh, from a neurobiological perspective, uh, how uh, signals are transmitted uh, in the central nervous system and processed in the, in the central nervous system that can be one particular factor that at a baseline, someone might have as a feature, um, whether or not there's a perception of injustice related to pain, that's a big prognostic, um, a prognostic indicator. Psychological disease might be one. If someone um, has a, uh, a chronic pain that they have overcome um, and now they develop a new injury, there's a greater chance of them developing a persistent pain problem again. So there's multiple things from an anatomical, uh, psychological, cognitive, and then neurobiological level that might lead to pain persistence. Um, so uh, a lot of them, you, you, need to, you need to dig really deep in order to identify and then figure out what are the factors in this person sitting in front of me that, that need to be addressed. Yeah, I'm going to break this down for our uh, listeners that are the average uh, folks and then our clinicians here. You really gave me like four or five really good things, and I'm going to kind of tie this together here. you you got to understand uh, as a clinician and as a patient, certain types of tissues heal along different rates. Uh, tendons, notoriously bad blood flow. Ligaments, similar. A little bit better, but not as good. So the time frame for physiological healing, the tissue actually to start healing 
for those things is significant and they can get stimulated along the process and keep the pain there. So it's not uncommon for a tendon injury. You're looking at months and months and months up to about a year, right? Same thing with the ligament. So for our listeners and our clinician, what tissue has been injured? And let's give you the proper expectation for the timeline. An absence of pain does not necessarily indicate the tissue is actually healed. That's what patients, they ask for, when am I going to be healed? We're really asking when the pain is going to be gone, right? So I want to make that clear, though, for the person that's listening to this. Absence of pain does not mean tissue healing, sufficient tissue healing. Second, we have to progressively with all tissues, human body, it needs physical load, exercise, strength, strengthening it. We need that. It's, it's imperative to us as human beings. At the very most basic is resisting the forces of gravity, right? So we need control over our body and we need tissue healing. And part of that is putting that through gradual exposure, progressive exercise to strengthen the tissue and build resiliency physically and then mentally and emotionally. Second, uh, third, Dr. M Dr. Uh, Dimitri mentioned nociception, fancy word for tissue is stimulated. And there are different ways tissue can be stimulated to maybe induce pain, heat, pressure, temperature, vibration. We got to remove that from the process because if the tissue is chronically stimulated over and over and over again, it starts to become potentially painful. Um, and the last thing and he mentioned, this is a big one, is the emotional, psychological, and cognitive state of the patient. Do they have a good relationship with their wife, their kids? Doc does. He That's his happy place, hanging out with his wife and kids. Maybe one day watching the kid put on hockey boots, right? Um uh, you know, but all of that stuff matters. If a patient's in a bad work situation, bad life situation, it can significantly bleed over to the risk factors for chronic pain. And that's kind of what Doc was trying to get at, those four or five things. What's their, what's their environment around them? What are their beliefs? What do they believe? Do they have chronic stimulation of the tissue? Are they gradually put through a strength training conditioning program so physically, mentally, and emotionally they can handle force and load? And then do we have the right time frame, the right diagnosis uh, as well? Doc, what's the psychology of a chronic pain patient? Like, what do you often see in your two settings? What, what's going on up top in the, in the chronic pain patient? Well, it's, it, it's well understood that chronic pain patients have a little bit greater incidence and prevalence of, of psychiatric disease. Um, so things like addiction, things like... Um, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, you name it. Like there, there's a greater kind of concentration of those types of um, psychiatric comorbidity. One thing that, that we do as part of our practice, as part of both of our practices is really do a deep dive into the psychological or the psychosocial history of the patient. And, and the reason why we do that is because we know that either big T trauma or little T trauma that accumulate over the course of a patient's life actually predisposes them or increases the likelihood or the odds of them having um, ill health later in life. So there was an awesome study that was published by Nelson in 2020 that examined the odds ratios or the odds of suffering from specific healthcare um, outcomes um, when they suffer from things like negligence or you know, big T or little t trauma and somatic diseases of which pain is one, um, the odds of it went up significantly the more trauma that person has, either big T or little t throughout their life. And um, so that's one thing that we look for. And then how does that kind of reverberate to the present day? So we also look for comorbid um, or alongside like psychological issues or challenges that the person is, is uh, suffering from. So do they have features of depression or anxiety? Do they have a perception of injustice? Uh, do they um, have an underlying personality disorder? But also socially, do they have, well, what's their environment? You touched on that. Are they, uh, so effectively what it, what it touches upon is this person's uh, neuroimmune and endocrine uh, access, this super system 
um, that allows us to reach homeostasis again or come back down from, from an immediate stressor, is that continuously being incited either by signals from, from the periphery, uh, nociception, a fancy word for like really high threshold forms of stimulation that might be associated with a pain response, but also inciting a perception of danger through external factors in your environment, which are associated with things like anxiety, fear, et cetera. And oftentimes these things can work together, both um, stress and, and, and pain, and they can, they're kind of two sides of the same coin and they influence each other. Uh, and that has been written about kind of exhaustively in, in the literature. So we want to make sure that, you know, every part of this patient is touched upon. Um, I know Greg Lehman talks about this quite often, but what's the ecosystem of the patient? But we take that a little bit further to talk about what's that person's environment and how has that environment been influenced by their past? So we kind of we kind of look at everything. Doc, how do we do this deep dive? I'm putting my clinical hat on. And um, one of the things I, I, I found over the course of 22 years of healthcare is that our intake forms are often very biased towards uh, acute pain. Do you have a traumatic event? And, um, you know, and, and if you can't, it just, it stops there. We don't deep dive enough into the other pieces, uh, the psyche, the emotion of the patient. So how does one as a clinician go through this deep dive to start investigating whether these risk factors are present or not? Great question. I mean, the first thing you can use is a body pain diagram, right? So what we know about the body pain diagram uh, is that first of all, widespread pain is a poor prognostic factor. And just because someone has widespread pain, you, you shouldn't just you know discount that patient as as a psych patient right away. But it should it should make you ask more questions about what's going on deeper um, in in that person's psyche. Um, uh, other studies have demonstrated that. So, for instance, if if one palm represents one um, one percent of the person's body surface area, people who shade greater than twenty percent of their body surface area actually have greater psychosocial stressor load, greater healthcare utilization, um, use more neuropathic pain descriptors, etc. So, generally, those people might be more distressed and. The, the level of distress that people have tend to, not always, but tend to actually increase as the area of pain increases in their body. So that's one way a really busy clinician can, can look at that. Um, using your history, the, the other thing that, I, that you might ask a patient is, do you, uh, do you worry and do you find it difficult to control that worry? Um, are you, do you have little interest in doing the things that you used to do? Or uh, clinically, that's known as anhedonia. Do you feel sad um, all or most of the time? So you can do a very generalized screen of depression. You can also use screening questionnaires that are very, very brief. For instance, the PHQ-2 is a two-question uh, questionnaire that looks at depression um, that has um, uh, pretty good uh, validity. And the GAD, the GAD 2 or the Generalized Anxiety Disorder 2 is another very, very quick thing that you can use. In our, in our practices, we use... Doc, do you know what those two questions are on the GAD or the PHQ-2? So the PHQ-2 uh, is, do you feel down, depressed, or sad all or most of the time? And then they, okay. the, the patient rates that between 0 and 6, I believe, or 0 and 3. So, so something to that effect. And then the second question on the PHQ-2 is, do you have little interest in, in doing things um, that, you used to, that you used to do uh, or that you used to have interest in doing? Um, and then the, the second one is, do you feel nervous, anxious, sorry, the GAD is, do you feel nervous, anxious, or on edge? And then you rate that between like on the Likert scale so that's the GAD2. And then the second question on the GAD2 is, do you worry so much and it's, it's difficult for you to control that worry? So people can be okay. worried, but is it difficult for them to control? So do they perseverate on, on things that, 
that, that they're worried about. And then what those, the way those questionnaires should be used in a standard format is if you score past a certain threshold, then you pull out the nine question um, questionnaires. So there's a PHQ nine, that's an extension of the PHQ two. So if you, if you score beyond a certain threshold on the two, you then break out the nine. And the same thing for the GAD. If you score past a certain threshold on the GAD 2, you would pull out uh, the GAD 7. So they're very easy questionnaires that can be used um, in, in one of two ways. And this is how I advise busy clinicians to use it. If you ask patients these questions after building a good rapport, you can then pull out the questionnaires and then use them as discussion points. Or if you're comfortable enough doing this, you can use them as screening questionnaires as part of your intake forms. So I, that's I, how one. Oh, that's how one of my my mentors, guy you know well, Thomas Lotus. He used to do the same thing. It used to be part of his intake yellow flag form, and I saw him shadowed him in the office several times. And it was like patients giving you the information right then and there, you know. And it's like right at intake, you have a good idea. Not, not, sometimes it takes you your, your, a uh, couple of visits to dig through the weeds, but you have a good idea of kind of what the state and maybe where the trajectory of this case is. And do I need to get a psychosocial intervention sooner rather than later? Yeah. So Tom, Tom's, Tom's become a good friend of mine, a really close friend of mine over the years. Um, I, I think I talk to him every other day and he's just a masterful clinician. I've learned so much from him. Um, and he and Annie actually um, introduced me to the yellow flag risk form. And I love it. I use it in my downtown um, uh, hospital based practice quite a bit. The challenge that we run into with the YFRF is that the studies that that the world of hurt group are, are, are conducting uh, still haven't been published. So we're waiting for those to be validated. Now, in talking to Annie, Annie O'Connor, she'll she'll share with us the data that they have and how they have validated it against other other questionnaires. So it's kind of a very good gestalt, one size fits all questionnaire. Um, but it, the, one the ring study, to rule them all. Pardon me. One ring. It's like to Lord rule of the Rings. All. One ring to rule them all. You got it. You got it. And um, so I love it. I didn't know the inventor of the yellow flags. I didn't know the inventor of the yellow flags form was actually Craig Leibson. One of the original yeah. inventors. Yeah, I had no idea. It blew my mind. And he's he's actually the next guest on the podcast. Oh, no way. You, you know what? I, yeah, yeah. I have mused upon who some of the most important chiropractors across, the, across our history um, uh, is or are. And Craig comes up in, in the top one or two or three for me every time I think about it because of how he's been able to change and institute change in chiropractic practice throughout the years. So kudos to you. You're going to have a great discussion with him. But yeah, the no, kudos for, to Craig for kudos to Craig for influencing us all. We're all like from that lineage. All the modern chiropractors that that are trying to do patients right, learning about it, and keep evolving. We have a lineage, and he's near the top of that lineage, and or, or the bottom of the lineage, and we all stem from that branch. Most definitely. Most definitely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the YFRF is great. I'm just waiting for it to, for the validation studies to be published. And that's a really good gestalt way of, um, of um, just kind of screening a patient. Another one is the Oribo pain questionnaire as a screening questionnaire, but it's a little long. It gets quite long. So I, um, I, I stay away from that one, but taking a great history yeah, and clinical build rapport. In clinical practice, uh, you know, you need effective, quick tools because um, you ultimately have a living, breathing being. And research is great for the research people. The translational reachers, how can I make my outcomes better and quicker and more efficient? That's the money for practicing folks like like you uh, you and I. You brought up Annie O'Connor. She first was the first person to introduce me. Um, and I, I was aware of this peripherally before, but really listening to her pain classification, which brings me to the next question. The problem with a lot of folks in clinical practice or even patients, they assume all pain is the same darn thing. And the reality is there's multiple drivers that lead to pain. I want you to take us through what are the drivers of what can lead to pain? I'm talking about pain mechanism subclassification. What can drive a chronic pain response? 
Great question. So, I mean, Annie's done this really quite well um, in her books and her courses, and she's really influenced me quite a bit. Um, so the International Association for the Study of Pain has three um, what they call mechanistic descriptors. And the three descriptors are nociceptive pain. So that is injury from um, non-neural tissue. So injury or threat to non-neural tissue. So things like tendinopathies, joint sprains, uh, muscle strains, you know, your mechanical pains, as we call them, are, are, are nociceptive pains. The second mechanistic descriptor that, uh, that the association has is neuropathic pain. And that is pain um, from injury, from lesion or disease of neural tissue. So nociceptive is non-neural neuropathic is neural, and that can be from the central nervous system and per, or peripheral nervous systems. Back in the day, the word dysfunction was included in that definition. Um, so it was lesion disease or dysfunction, but patients with fibromyalgia were being lumped into that as well. So they took up dysfunction at some point there. At, so it's just disease or lesion, right? And then the third mechanistic descriptor is nociplastic pain. And really what that boils down to is um, that either peripheral uh, nociceptive, so non-neural tissue or neural tissue disease or, uh, or a lesion cannot fully and holistically um, describe the pain that this person is experiencing. So somewhere within the, the nociceptive system, either in the peripheral receptor or the tracks um, and, and brain uh, areas that, that actually process these incoming signals has, has changed in a way that continues to enable that person to experience pain despite the fact that there might be little to no um, peripheral injury. So that those are the three mechanistic descriptors. Now, Annie, the way she has outlined them quite masterfully is that they, um, she's, she's added, so you know, peripheral neuropathic, um, nociceptive, I'm, I'm, I'm using her words loosely here, uh, affective central sensitivity and um, and um, the other one is motor autonomic, I believe. And the way I've broken it down in my clinical practice and when I teach people is, so I talk about the three mechanistic descriptors, but I don't like calling them, um, I, I don't like calling them classifications. I like calling them phenotypes because really it's, it's about understanding what that patient is presenting with. And then that determines how you're going to, how you're going to act, how you're going to change what you're doing as a clinician. So the, the, the verbiage that I use are nociceptive, neuropathic, nociplastic, and then psychoemotional. And the reason why I include psychoemotional there is that patient needs needs to be lumped in to this. And then also the International Association for the Study of Pain, really nowhere in these mechanistic descriptors do they bring up the, the patient's psychological status, which we know is very important in, in, in pain. So the way I describe the psycho-emotional phenotype is that no matter what the underlying mechanistic descriptor is, that the person's dominant determinant of health is their psycho-emotional health, right? So this person could have mechanical back pain. You know, they, if you were to do, you know, three sets of 15 um, prone press-ups, their pain would go away, but this person's so depressed that they can't even bring themselves to do it. You know mm. what I mean? So the, the primary yeah, yeah. health in that case is, is their psycho-emotional status. They're so anxious that you can't mobilize them. You can't do anything with them because they're so fearful and anxious. Well, does this person has have an underlying significant anxiety disorder that is unmanaged, that is stopping them from engaging in the behavioral strategies that they need to do in order to heal their pain, in order to get better? So that's there's some detective work in there that we need to do. 
And the interesting, crazy thing is a patient can morph from one category to another. And if you're not paying attention, you'll miss the subtle change and continue with the treatment strategy. And what once was productive no longer is productive, right? You'd stop making progress or you start doing a 180 and going the opposite way. And you're thinking to yourself, man, like this had so much promise. What happened? And then you're just like, I made this mistake, you know, like, well, it's on the patient. They're not executing the plan. Or now, you know, like, oh, the unmasking of the psych component, you know, they always were. And I just, I missed it. You know, uh, you know, 22 years, you make some, you have some success, you have some failures. I've missed the subtle changes. They, the point of where I'm going is people can change. And if you're not paying attention to what's going on in the moment, you can have a patient that is afraid, but you address that. And then mechanical, and then you push the mechanical and they get better. And then they, there's another unmasking. There's another something that came up in their life, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're back to, I need to address the brain. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I call that a phenotypic switch. That's, that, that's the verbiage that I've used to, to describe that, is that someone might have a significant psychological or nociplastic component. Um, and then once that is addressed it's um, they, they, they then become potentially responsive to things that they weren't otherwise responsive to previously. I want to dive into your, your categorizations. You mentioned these categories of nociceptive, uh, nociceptive, uh, neuropathic, and then cognitive, emotional, psychological. Um, first, the definition of nociceptive for our average folks is what? So that is pain um, that is very, very real that a person is experiencing that is not otherwise explained by tissue damage, or at least not proportionately described by or explained by tissue damage um, to things like ligaments, muscle, bone, cartilage, et cetera, or to nerve damage, either to the brain, spinal cord, or to our nerves that are outside of the spinal cord or peripheral nervous system. It's usually okay. associated with some kind of patient distress as well. In some respect. Okay. And then next one, nociceptive. For our average folks, non-medical folks, what does nociceptive mean? So nociceptive pain is defined as pain that is a product of non-neural tissue damage. So that is from, again, ligaments, tendons, bone, skin, cartilage, you, you name it. Okay. So Third like categorization, neuropathic break that word down for us. What does that type of pain look like? So neuropathic is, is defined as pain that is a product of uh, damage to, to nerve tissue. So brain, spinal cord, or uh, nerves that are in the periphery outside of the spinal cord. And then psychological, cognitive, emotional, um, loosely. I think most people understand those words, but loosely, uh, how would we describe or define that? So the, the, way, the way I define that is that people might fall within any of the mechanistic descriptors that I've, that I've described, but the predominant determinant of patient's health in those cases is their psycho-emotional status. So it's, you know, gotcha. it's really, yeah, really significant depression or anxiety or something like that. PTSD. Now let's treatment match. We have an idea of what these categories are. Let's match the right treatments that are available, that you, history, exam, uh, research suggestion. The most common one I see as a chiropractor in my office, I can see anything in my office, but noisyceptive pain. Typically, what's effective for treating noisyceptive based pain? What tools are available? So um, I'm, a, I, I'm really biased towards the McKenzie um, uh, line of thinking. So I use a lot of uh, end range loading. So taking the joint and bringing it to its available end range and uh, with overpressure, et cetera. So that's usually my default for, um, for uh, nociceptive pain, um, but also loading the tissues. So doing things like isometric strengthening, you know, pr progressive, progressive loading in some way. Um, so that's, that's really, those are really my go-to for, for nociceptive pain. So loading the tissue in some way to create adaptation. Um, I find that nociceptive pains are usually the ones that are best responsive to things like manual therapy, right? Um, more often than not. 
they're they're most responsive to that to that particular mechanistic descriptor. But I'm a uh, I'm a big fan. For, of uh, Sorry, go on. Go ahead, Doc. No, no, so please, please. Thank you. I, I, I'm a big fan of. Uh, there's a researcher out there from Duke University by the name of Chad Cook, who's actually researching this now um, for for manual and rehabilitative therapists. And one of the things that he talks about from from the perspective of manual therapy is that it's a good way of modulating pain in general. In my experience, and I have absolutely no data to prove this because the studies aren't, aren't really that great, is that manual therapy typically works the best in people with more nociceptive pains, right? Am, am, I, am I happy to be wrong and, and just not observing things properly and, you know, the other mechanistic descriptors, you know, respond quite favorably? Fair. In my experience, those are the ones that do the best. Yeah, I, I'm going to echo your your statements here. That's been my clinical experience uh, as well. And again, I, I 20 years from now, I could be wrong. As long as I evolve with the data, I'm, I'm happy, uh, you know, with that. But more of the story is for our listeners, uh, nociceptive pain usually responds to either applying force or reducing force to specific tissues, muscles, tendons, ligaments, joints, fascia. Um, and a pl application of force or reduction of force to specific tissues, hands-on therapy, manipulation, uh, end range loading like a cobra, uh, usually reduces the stimulation, mechanical stimulation to those tissues, which potentially could drive pain. All right, let's treatment match now. We got nociceptive pain done, neuropathic pain. What has a tendency to work for neuropathic-based based pain patterns? So some manual therapy can can help with neuropathic pain descriptors depending on the condition. So if you have um, like a, a radiculopathy or radicular pain, for instance, where there's there's some kind of um, threat or, or, or inflammation or damage to a nerve um, in and around the spine, and sometimes doing things like end range loading can be helpful for those. Um, if you have a nerve entrapment somewhere, then perhaps um, you know, doing something to the tissue that surrounds that nerve might be might be helpful. I, I don't really know if we if we truly and holistically understand the the biological effects of what what mediates the favorable response. But in some in some cases that could that could do it. But I think it depends on what the what the condition is. Things like uh, neurodynamics can also be helpful. Um, and really what I think we're doing there is, <clears throat> is um, taking a nerve that is very, very uh, sensitive and, and just desensitizing it in some way. Uh, the neurobiology is really debatable. Um, I know Mike Shacklock has talked a lot about that, but you know, there are different ideas from David Butler and um, Axel, uh, I think it's Axel Schaffler uh, from, from, from Australia. I know, uh, but but if you have if you have um, persistent neuropathic pain from a, a different disorder like a diabetic peripheral neuropathy or a spinal cord injury or a brain injury, and actually just doing cardiovascular exercise is very important uh, because of all of the increase in blood flow going to the area, but also because it dumps out a bunch of neurochemicals that can that can uh, offer pain relief and and heal nerves as well that that have become injured. So. The, that's a very layered question when it comes to neuropathic pain because there's a lot of opinions, there's a lot of experience, but the neurobiology behind what what the, the the pain relieving effect is is really quite debatable. So it doesn't devalue the the therapy; it's the narrative around that therapy that that I think is is most important to talk about. Yeah, the scientific mechanisms are uh, quest questionable. Uh, but we, we can see the outcomes change sometimes by applying, like you said, like a cardiovascular exercise and, you know, how it works. No, we just know that it's good general health and then potentially it could help that nerve. Same thing with the neurodynamic uh, exercise. And you're right. There are multiple layers to uh, neuropathic injuries. Diabetic neuropathy is different than compression neuropathy. It's different than spinal cord injury, uh, you know, uh, as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, and there's nuances to it. Generally speaking, noisy plastic pain, um, what treatments are available? What treatments should we route our patients towards for that uh, classification or a phenotype of, of pain? 
So one thing that I'm kind of falling in love with uh, in recent years is identifying what the patient's goals are and then really, really, you know, educating that patient in such a way that it allows them to, to change the meaning behind what, what pain is to them. So is it really something that they need to fear and, and feel in danger from? And then gradually exposing them to something that is, that is valuable to them. So I have, I have patients who tell me, you know, I just want to, I want to be able to walk the dog for 30 minutes a day, but if I walk more than five minutes, I have pain. So it's really just about, well, what's, what's the, is that pain that you're experiencing? Is that an indication that you're, that you're having a new tissue injury or really is it something like that you're pushing on something that's a little bit sensitive? And if you just kind of lean into it, um, through, through the lens of safety, as opposed to through the lens of fear, can you desensitize it and actually improve quality of life and, and reduce pain? Um, the other thing that's, that's really important to recognize with regards to nociplastic pain is that it could be very richly connected to chronic systemic low-grade inflammation. So the, the analogy I give people, patients, when I describe this is that you can have a pot that boils over right? So you're boiling spaghetti, the pot boils over. And you can think about that as like a, an inflammatory disease like rheumatoid arthritis or um, Sjogren's syndrome or uh, scleroderma or something like that, right? But you can also have a simmering pot that isn't boiling over, but it's kind of simmering. And based on lifestyle, um, the, that person can, can have an increase in this like kind of chronic low-grade systemic inflammation and what that does is it lowers firing threshold for like everywhere across our, our, our nervous system, our neuroimmune system. And <clears throat> so lifestyle factors are actually very important to address there. So um, things like, is the person um, getting adequate uh, exercise? Are they sleeping well? Um, how's their stress levels? Um, is there, is there a dietary component here that we need to address? And you, you need to, is, are they a smoker? Do they consume a lot of alcohol? Like, so, so we're looking at various lifestyle factors therein. And if those changes happen over, over the course of time, can their low grade chronic systemic inflammation improve? Um, the last thing I look at with regards to nociplastic pain is really really addressing fear um, and then what that might enable someone to do is confront pain in a way that is um, uh, allows them to desensitize whatever is going on. So uh, there's yeah, I think uh, oh, there. Yeah, for our, our average listener, uh, the most common one and Doc alluded to this in this area is that uh, there's a condition called complex regional pain syndrome, and that's when a patient suffered an injury, a trauma, car accident, a surgery or something. And for example, I crush my wrist um, trying to skateboard and I catch myself and then the fracture is healed. But one year later, I don't want to move my wrist. I can't look at my wrist in the mirror. I don't want to touch my wrist. I don't want you to touch my wrist. Like it is literally like this part is like not functioning, not functioning locally, but the part of my brain that controls the wrist is not, they're not synced. And that creates, you know, abnormal reactions. You'll see the, the skin color change, the blood vessels change. You'll start to see abnormal thoughts and reactions about it. And what Doc is talking about is a comprehensive approach, addressing fear first telling you that it's going to be okay, looking at your goals. What do you want your hand to do? Man, I just want to be able to carry my baby again, right? That's something simple. And then slowly start starting to unwire and unpack that little by little by little and building confidence. And when you start working from confidence down, you may start to notice some of the physical stuff start to change. But that process takes a while. You really have to groove it, practice it like – you know, a Canadian uh, hockey player putting the puck in the five hole or a basketball player can shoot free throws with their eyes closed because they practice it over and over and over again. Your body part and the brain to body part needs practice. You need to groove those neural pathways 
so that eventually sensitivity calms down and you get hand use. The fracture healed, your brain doesn't think so. Yeah. Is there, that actually, a good description? Yeah. It, 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 with, with that particular condition, there's, there's both what we call central factors in the, in the brain and the spinal cord that are really quite relevant, but then there's also factors um, with regards to inflammation and so on in that wrist and in, in that general area that are important as well. Um, there, there is a specific uh, diagnostic criteria for that particular clinical syndrome uh, called the Budapest criteria <clears throat> and now been updated uh, through the Valencia criteria in 2022, I believe. But be, be that as it may, um, th there was an excellent study, I think in 2015, uh, I believe the first author was or one of the authors was Johan Vleyen. And what they did for patients with complex regional pain syndrome was expose them to things that they were fearful to. And that was the treatment. And then they compared mm -hmm. just a fear-based uh, exposure-based uh, therapy um, to what your usual care would be, like desensitization and pharmacological stuff and so on and so forth. And at the very least in the upper extremity, the, the uh, gradual exposure to fear, uh, fear-based activities or activities that the person was fearful to actually did much better than the, um, than the comparator group. So there's something to fear that's very important. Um, exactly how it hashes out, I don't think we really know, uh, but, it, but it is very important. Yeah, I had a, a patient not too long ago that was a clinical psychologist and chronic back pain, fear avoidance. And I was like, I'm progressively going to exercise you. And she's like, I, I don't know if that's going to work. I'm in you know, pretty good shape. I'm like, but you're avoiding blank, blank, and blank. And I'm like, I'm going to put this in your, your context. You know what arachnophobia is? She's like, of course. Right? You're asking me like a kindergarten question for a clinical psychologist. Yeah. I was like, is it the spider? No, it ain't the spider, especially if it's not venomous. You know, and I'm like, why are people afraid of it? You know, and then what's the goal? And she's just like getting you in the same room with the spider and moving you close and eventually having the tarantula walk on you. And I was like, that's exactly what we're going to do with exercise. I'm going to expose it to you in a non-threatening way. I'm going to push you a little further each time you come in to the point where you're touching it. You're touching that pain. Right. And then eventually you're going to groove the circuitry where you're touching that pain. You're going further into it, further in it. Next thing you know. It's gone and your fear is gone as well. And she's like, that's what you're doing. And I'm like, it's exactly what I'm doing. It's no different. It's just exercise is the tool. I, I, I agree with you there. And there's, there's various ways to help a patient with that. Like exactly the way you described it. Uh, there are some meditation based practices or mindfulness based practices that can also be implemented therein. Um, so the, that area, like looking at, nociplastic pain is actually a really interesting frontier in, in pain medicine research right now, simply because there's a lot of controversy surrounding that particular mechanistic descriptor. And um, even its diagnostic uh, categories are, are, are thought to be flawed by many. So there's a lot to be done uh, in that area. And I, I don't think anybody has completely hit the nail on the head yet. My, my belief is um, that- with, with sub with sub um, um, with sub classifications therein, right? That, that's what I foresee in the future. Let's get a couple, couple quick hitters, uh, a couple sound bites here. Um, uh, so the role of uh, self guided treatments in chronic pain. Self guided treatments. I'm lumping meditation, yoga, tai chi. What do you feel the role of self guided, you know, movement based therapy is in chronic pain? I think self. Where would that fit? I think self-management is the most important thing that you can give your patient the ability to do, right? And that's, and that's very, it, it, the way I structure it is this way. Um, what, in, in a general sense, first of all, I need, to, I need to educate that patient about what's going on in their body and, the, and give them the ability to understand that just because they experience pain doesn't mean that there's tissue damage happening at that particular time. There might be, there, the threshold might be low for detecting a threatening stimulus, but it might not be tissue damage and that threshold can move. So how do you detect that? Now, Annie O'Connor and for, for, for the watchers or listeners here, 
Um, if you look up the, um, the traffic light analogy for movement-based pain that Annie O'Connor talks about, that is something that I use quite ubiquitously with chronic pain patients to, to give the patient an understanding of when is, when is pain potentially an indication of new tissue injury or aggravation of an existing tissue injury versus something like, oh, you have a sunburn, but you're touching the sunburn. You're not putting more UV radiation on them, right? Um, so I, I'll often talk about that. Um, and then it's gradual exposure to something. Um, and then the person needs to come up with goals for that they're trying to attain because if they're just meaninglessly, uh, going through the motions and they don't have a why, then it becomes difficult to find the, the internal motivation to be able to engage in, in, in things that, that are, that matter to them. So why should they exercise? Why should they do things? So things should be very goal oriented. This is what I'm trying to achieve. And then part of your gradual exposure among other things need to be geared towards developing the ability to, to reach those goals. Um, being generally physically active is very important as well. Um, and then also having a flare up plan. So if someone does uh, experience a, a significant flare up, then what do they do about it? Right? So how, what, what, you know, what do they implement in order to help them get through that flare up and learn from it? It's like, oh, you know what? I shouldn't have gone to that level. I'm not there yet. So where do I lie in this spectrum of self-care? And then how do I level it up from there, right? So reconceptualizing flare ups as, as learning, as uh, how do I get over this, as overcoming this is, is very important. And I think that your, your relationship with your clinician is very important there. Uh, but not from the per, not from necessarily from the perspective of of manual therapy, but to imparting the the knowledge that the patient needs to have in order to self manage in, in perpetuity. I like what you mentioned there, and uh, I think that's an excellent point. So I'm definitely going to reiterate that flare up is a learning tool. Hey, don't don't woe is me. You learn. You learn part of it where you can take that information so you can help yourself self treat. Uh, so you don't need uh, oral steroids. Uh, you don't need an epidural. You don't need to get on my schedule. Uh, you can be more robust and independent. Uh, I like that. Reframing that as a um, you know flare up as, as learning. I, I will discuss it as uh, especially in the spine pain world, which you know fifty sixty percent of my patients are spine. Uh, you know uh, I would say I would say probably sixty percent forty percent are extremity that um, have you ever gotten a cold or a flu before? Yes. We can do everything we can. You can get sleep, you can get your vitamin C, you can get your vitamin D. You can, you know, uh, during peak flu season, wear a mask and yeah, you could still get a cold, you know? And what do you do when you have a cold? Do everything you can once you have it to get over as quickly as possible and move on with your life. That is the nature of spine pain and you have to understand it. So if this flare up is gonna happen, I want to empower you to be successful, to self-manage and self-treat. And if you understand it's going to happen and now you gave me a tool that's important, I'm going to insert this in the conversation. You're going to learn, right? And if you learn about what, what the trigger was or the events around the trigger, you can reduce the likelihood and the duration, the disability of that flare. So now you can, you can move that forward. I like that. That's a really good point that you brought up. And I'm going to include that in my educational piece. Uh, I'm honored. I'm honored. Thanks. Um, real quick, there's a couple other little areas I want to get to on the treatment aspect. What do you feel the role is of acupuncture in the treatment of chronic pain? Uh, your acupuncture trained with the McMaster is one of the best courses out there. What do you feel that role is? Quite truthfully, I don't use it very much anymore. Um, one, because I think it takes away from my ability to develop that plan with the patient. Um, and, and also because I don't want them to become um, dependent on, on getting stuck with a needle. The, I, I think the role is very similar to, to manual therapy. I, I, I actually believe, and again, I have no data to prove this. This is just an idea. I actually believe that things like acupuncture and manual therapy, no matter how you cut it, actually, actually have the same underlying uh, neurobiological properties that, that that create the pain relieving effect. So it modulates pain in some way. 
um, where I most often use acupuncture um, is if someone is really uh, just kind of uh, anxious, if they're really amped up and I need to do something to kind of just let them stay in a room for a little while with some music on, still not being able to do anything to kind of bring them down. Usually stimulating the needle can impart some physiological response that might be calming or pain relieving, which can then be calming as well. So I won't use it too many times in, in a treatment program with a patient, but those are really the patients that I use it the most on. And I find over the years, I'm using it less and less and less and less. Yeah, it's a parasympathetic. Sitting in a dark room with calming music is stimulating the parasympath parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, the reality is they can get that with mindful meditation on their own without a needle in them. And I'm not opposed to acupuncture. I, I did some acupuncture training at Logan Chiropractic School. Uh, it's just interesting to see where the studies are going because they're not overwhelming uh, on acupuncture in terms of, is it a good chronic pain relief tool? Is it the tool of choice? What is the role of it? We do know there's a local effect underneath the needle, the needle effect, which you get from actually any needle. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, And then we do know that there are studies where it lights up sensory processing centers in the brain and it's tendency to turn the volume button down. But you can get that through other modalities, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, meditation, yoga, Pilates, a patient exercising as well. So I, I'm curious too, like you, where, 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 what, what will the, the research show on acupuncture? And I think you're right on the treatment match, right? Like I can match that person. They need, they need parasympathetic drive. Cool. I'll throw some needles on you, make you sit in a dark room. Yeah. What does the future hold for it? I'm really not sure. Um, I, I have found that over the years, the people that, that I know who, who manage chronic pain, um, more than anything, use it less and less, and they only use it in very specific instances, like like the one I described, where you just gotta kind of bring that person down a little bit. If you look at the majority of the Cochrane reviews on acupuncture for back pain or neck pain, they're not really they're not really robust. they're not overwhelming. Yeah, they're not yeah. overwhelmingly good. Um, so I think that what 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 they're trying to identify, like everyone's trying to identify who's the specific patient that it would be it would be best utilized in. I don't think they're ever going to find that. I've got two more on the treatment aspect, and then I got a couple questions to add to end this. Uh, there's two more things that keep coming up in the realm of chronic pain. What is the role of pain management procedures? The pain management guys, unfortunately, you get some really great ones that are like let's do everything and then let's do this or we need to sub, you know, pull that person out of your candidate pool because they've got neuropathic pain or, or they need something uh, out of that. And then you've got the other ones that are trying to throw stimulators or medications at everybody. Everything is a procedure. So who needs uh, to go to pain management? Who needs a procedural approach? Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it from my unique bias, if, if that's okay. So my, yeah, uh, please, as a please. yeah I, I mean, as a chiropractor, my bias is that from, as a default is that I can't do procedures, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to use every conservative measure that I can. And when those are unsuccessful, I might level it up in some way. Um, now, if you're, if you're a physi an interventional physiatrist, or if you're an anesthesiologist, that's your tool, that's what you're gonna use, right? So I, I'm a big fan of stepped care. That's my, that, that's kind of my thing. So try the things that are most easily accessible first and, and um, usually most beneficial to a patient with, with the least amount of cost um, to, the, to the healthcare system and to the patient. And then if those don't work, level it up. And if that doesn't work, level it up. And if that doesn't work, level it up. Um, so that's kind of the way I think about it. There are certain instances where you're going to, you're going to skip steps. So if someone has, so for instance, I saw a patient the other day who he has a, a left shoulder. He's been unresponsive to care. Well, we did one visit. This this was already in the works. The MRI was in the works. But you look at his bone humeral joint, and he has um, swelling inside the joint capsule. 
So I'm like, yeah, no matter, no matter what I do, something is going on in that, in that joint that is not going to allow me to, 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 to help him. And that's the reason why he's been unresponsive in, in my opinion. He gets an injection, doesn't work. Now I'm thinking, okay, we need to investigate what the source of that swelling is. Because is there, is there uh, a joint injury that's deep in there that, you know, this person's going to need surgery for, right? Uh, another one might be a um, frozen shoulder. So we know that manual therapy doesn't do a lot of great stuff for frozen shoulder, probably at the baseline in the early phases, if you get a hydrodilatation procedure, that person might have a, especially from a pain perspective, might have a more favorable outcome, right? If you have, if you have multimyotomal weakness or multiple levels of weakness from a lumbar disc herniation and you have more leg pain than you do back pain um, and you start to lose bowel and bladder, that person needs surgery. You see what I mean? So you need to you, move quick. <laughs> yeah, you, you need to move quick, right? Um, you need to move quick. Yeah, you need to move quick, right? So step care is good as a as a, a kind of a blanket statement, but there are going to be people who skip. So I think the onus is on the clinician to determine what needs what what the needs of the patient are when. And it also depends on the tools that you use, which is why I think guidelines are very important. So if you look at the nice guidelines for low back pain and, and radiculopathy, they don't advocate steroid injections. They don't advocate for steroid injections kind of on a blanket statement simply because the data isn't there demonstrating favorable outcomes. But I can't tell you the number of people I've seen who have had favorable outcomes. So I can't reconcile that in my brain. Um, they... Um, so that it's a very loaded question because I think certain people need certain things at different times. Um, so to apply a singular methodology to every patient, I think is wrong. So it's really just about figuring out who needs what. Um, and that's you putting have, your bias on the patient when they come in and you, you hear that and you're like, you're going to get this. And then, you know, and that may not lead to clinical success. You're biasing, you're bias influencing what, that patient experience rather than the patient bringing their information to you and you shifting the direction of the sale based on, you know, what's going on that day. What are the patient's goals? What does your experience say that that triple headed uh, part uh, of the stool? Yeah. So unless, uh, unless something is making me believe that that patient needs to skip the rung in the ladder, I'm always going to do a trial of care first, right? I'm always going to do a trial um, of care first. We're, let's uh, finish up with two questions here. Um, first visit, you got you are smelling, you're sniffing, you're you're sniffing out a chronic pain patient. What do we need to know to initiate that trial of care to best help that patient? Day one, what do we need to know about? You're thinking, you're suspecting you have a chronic pain patient. What do we need to know? What do we need to know from the patient? Yeah, what do we need to know about the patient, the case, the situation? Like, what do we need to know to accurately treat and manage manage this patient? So from my, the way I approach this is really, is a little bit different. So I want to know the timeline of their, uh, of their pain. And how did it start? Why did it start? What were the circumstances with, with, it, with which it started? And then how did it change over time? Um, and then I look uh, at your standard things like pain ratings, aggravating, relieving, paresthesia, or tingling, things like that. I'm really looking heavily into their past medical history because I want to determine whether or not there's an underlying condition that can be an underlying cause for this. Uh, I'm also looking at their underlying injury history. Like, is this something that they've gotten through before um, that they need help with getting through now? And why is that? Um, I'm diving deep into their medications, comorbidities. We know that a significant number of comorbidities actually reduces the, uh, makes the prognosis for that patient less favorable. So am I already behind the eight ball because this person has X number of comorbidities or healthcare conditions already, which is going to increase the complexity of that patient. So I know that the, the Danish group, uh, Jan Hartvigsen is studying this quite quite a lot. And they've, they've actually looked at a cohort of diabetic patients and published a paper really recently on this in, in low back pain. 
Um, I'm really diving deep into that patient's psychological status and psychological history, psychosocial history. Um, and then the one thing that I do in the clinical examination is, is there anything that I can do? Can I provoke this patient's pain? And if I keep provoking it lightly, does, does it desensitize? So that's one thing I'm looking for. But rather than looking for a tissue-specific diagnosis, which is what the way we're, we're trained, oh, this person has a chem, positive chemist test, they have, a, they have a facet joint arthropathy, oh, they have a, uh, an empty can test, they have a supraspinatus, or they have a, a subacromial decompression or sub, subacromial impingement, whatever that is. Um, like, rather than using a specific tissue, like a tissue-specific diagnosis, I'm looking for is there a way I can load the patient or change the way that that person moves in order to reduce pain? And that becomes the treatment. So from that standpoint, yeah. I don't care what the diagnosis is. I, I care more about the fact that, okay, if, if I change this or if I tinker with this or if I get them to move in this very specific way, it elicits this favorable outcome. And then that becomes the treatment. And I just tug on that thread for as long as I need to until the patient gets better. So can I share yeah. one or two examples? Go, go. So if I have a patient who has um, radicular, radicular pain, so pain in the leg that's coming from the back. So if I get them to lay prone and go into a cobra position or prone press-ups multiple times and that takes their pain away, well, that becomes their treatment. And then it, and then I gradually expose them to the things that they want to do, like running or weightlifting or anything for that matter, lifting, yada, 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 in order for them to get better. I have another patient, for instance, who had a, um, who had a lateral ankle sprain. So they had um, just an inversion sprain of their ankle. And this was weeks ago. They came to me. They had no pain at all. And they're just like, I can't walk. And I'm sitting there, I'm pushing and pulling and tugging on this thing. And I'm just like, I can't recreate your pain. So let's see what's going on. And I get her to run and she takes one step and she's just like, I, I'm sending the signal from my brain to my leg and I can't push off. Like she just can't do it. So that falls into the realm of something like almost like a functional neurologic disorder, right? Like, and that's a specific DSM-5 diagnosis. I didn't render that disorder. I didn't render that diagnosis because it's outside of my scope of practice, but you can easily recognize it. And I started just loading this patient on one leg just to start to get them comfortable with the notion of, of loading that leg again. And she started to walk a little bit better, but she was still kind of weird when she walked. And the idea that I was, con that the cognitive thing that she was, that was driving her was that People told me that if I have a lateral ankle sprain, I will be vulnerable to ankle sprains the rest of my life. And then that translated to an inability to run, even though she had no pain. So what I did with her was I brought her into our gym and I said, can you, can you run? She couldn't do it. I said, can you run backwards? And she could do it no problem. So automatically I was like, something, something from a functional neurological perspective is happening here. So I said, can you walk on your toes? She said, yeah, and she started walking on her toes. And I said, what I want you to do is start jogging on your toes. So she couldn't go through a heel toe pattern, but she could tiptoe and run. So I said, okay, start doing it a little bit faster. And I started getting her to sprint. Like I started running ahead of her and hitting the ground with a dowel and be like, beat me to it, beat me to it. And like, she started running like crazy and going back and forth and back and forth. And I said, if there was something really wrong with your ankle, you couldn't have done that. And then it was like the light bulb went off. She goes, okay, I can run again. And we yeah. suddenly started running one, two, five, ten 10 kilometers after a couple, after a couple weeks of just loading the ankle gradually. For so, our American yeah. folks out here, it's 1.6 kilometers to a mile. Just in case yeah. you're wondering. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I was in a, I was, uh, I teach as. You're in the zone. <laughs> I, I teach as part of a, uh, I was part of the primary care spine care program out of the university. Of yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I was talking about, I, I said something about kilometers and they were just like, what did you say, Canuck? Kilometers? What the, <laughs> what the heck is that? How many miles is that? 
5K <laughs> is 3.1, 10K, 6.2. And you're losing me after that. Fair, yeah. So it, 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 um, it, for me, it's just about finding the tool that helps that patient like uh, treat themselves. So I I'm, hope I'm, you charge that lady. I hope you charge that lady a case fee because if you made her run on one visit after not coming in, uh, American Healthcare, you get paid per visit. Like, th- I hope you got a case fee for that because you took her from nothing to something in one visit. Yeah, that'll, that'll be a thousand bucks. It was like five or six visits. It was like five or six visits. But still, was still, I hope you got paid a case fee for that. <laughs> That's good work. Thank you. Yeah, um, your toes. Like, yeah. <laughs> just try and try and catch her in a. Uh, try and violate that expectation that she couldn't do it. And then suddenly the light bulb went on. She's like, oh, I can do it. And then, yeah. I often find it very interesting that uh, a person that we all hold in high esteem because of the totality of the body of work, like uh, in America, there's Mount Rushmore and like four of the best presidents are on Mount Rushmore. And then my chiropractic and healthcare Mount Rushmore is like Craig Liebenson, Stu McGill. He's pretty rough with patients and he will test them and push them. And if you've ever seen his history and his exams, He's literally having them do things. They're just like, I don't know if I can do it. And then when they do it, you know, it, it, it starts a ripple effect. Like, oh, that, that wasn't that bad, you know. So part of the beauty of him is how he gets into people's mind and literally helps them to their goal when they're putting up the obstacle. And it's it's, it's mastery to watch, you know, yeah. not just because he's so astute uh, from a research standpoint, but because he'll he'll get into the inner workings of the brain, right, by putting them in those positions. Yeah, I, um, um, I mean, last, uh, so much from Stu, I mean, fellow Canadian, right? Um, I've, I've learned so much yeah. from Stu in my career, so he would, he's definitely been an influence on me for sure. Um, key key uh, patient materials. Um, you've had to have come across a website link, a pamphlet, a flyer, something that you can give to a patient um, that's easily digestible, that meets them where they are. Do you have any key resources, and I will put these in the show notes, that you provide to patients or try this website out? Right. So um, I like to use a lot of analogies. And all the analogies I use with patients, I steal from other people. So I'm gonna give I'm gonna give credit where credit's due. So the first one that I use with my chronic pain patients is uh, the Twin Peaks model that was um, featured as part of Explain Pain Supercharged that was published in 2018 by uh, David Butler and Laura Mosley. And really what that stipulates is that there's a buffer zone between pain and tissue injury and that the, the buffer zone is actually a plastic phenomenon that changes after an injury happens. So not all pain is equivalent to tissue injury and really what it might be is that the buffer zone for, for the experience of pain um, is very large um, and quite far away from, from where tissue injury actually happens. Um, so there's a lot of really good YouTube videos on that. Um, the, the one I already mentioned is the uh, traffic light analogy for movement safe pain. Um, that's readily available on the internet. If you look up traffic light analogy pain, it will come up. And that was originated by Melissa Kolsky and Annie O'Connor um, um, it wasn't, I don't believe it was featured in their book, but our good friend, Tom Lotus and Annie actually, uh, published something on that in, I can't remember which textbook it was, but it was in, uh, it was in a textbook really quite recently. Um, but the actual breakdown of, of the analogy is actually readily available online and free to use for patients, uh, and clinicians alike. And I use that one quite a bit. Was it in Rehab of the Spine, third edition? Craig Craig came out with a, a third edition, and uh, if memory serves me correct, Tom uh, has a chapter that he co-published, uh, possibly on this area. Um, I, I'm drawing a blank right now. Was possibly that one? Yeah, I know Tom. I know Tom was part of that textbook, and that was. Uh, but I don't. I think that was strictly on on mechanical diagnosis. MD, MDT. Okay. Yeah, but uh, they they wrote a chapter in another textbook that was just on pain classifications, and I think that they integrated the uh, if I remember if memory serves, and I know I'm going to get an, a phone call from Tom after he hears this. <laughs> I'm going to get a hate mail from Tom after this. <laughs> don't worry, text. don't worry, you're you're fine. He'll come after me harder. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, but I believe uh, they they published it as part of that textbook. Um, but but anyway, it comes it comes from Annie, 
uh, first and foremost. Um, and um, so, so that resource is readily available. Another, another analogy that I use with patients is, uh, is one that came from Peter O'Sullivan. He calls it the cliff analogy. So essentially things like injury and pain and flare-ups can happen when you fall off of the, fall off of the cliff. And we as clinicians are trying to get people back onto the cliff edge. But when repeated flare-ups happen or something like that, we need to ask the question, why are people so close to the cliff face? Why are they so close to the edge? Why aren't they far enough from the cliff face so that way they have that reserve before they have a flare-up? And things like poor sleep, like um, lack of recovery, psycho-emotional stressors, you name it, any number of things can bring people closer to the cliff face. So how do we give people that reserve um, enough gas in the tank? Or, or how do we shift them so that they're from at the cliff face or off the cliff all the time away from the cliff? So I use a personal story as a chronic back pain sufferer. I've had back pain since I was 18. I'm 38 now, and I've really developed mastery over it in the last five years, and I'll have a flare-up just picking up kettlebells and be like, oh, what the hell happened again? I lifted the same thing yesterday. Why am I losing it today? Um, and it could, could be an accumulation of forces going through the spine, but what I've noticed is that the precursor to that injury is that I don't want to be there that day lifting. So why am I in that headspace? Well, for weeks now, I've been working so hard. I've been going to bed late. I've had a lot of work stress. I'm not sleeping. There are a number of different stressors. And that brings me closer to the cliff face. And then I lift up that kettlebell and then I fall off. So what I, I have to interfere when I don't feel like being there. And I need to think retrospectively, like, why am I so close to the cliff face now? I need to work on these other things. I need to make sure that all these other things are taken care of as well as my fitness, right? Um, I, I also use, um, there's an awesome YouTube video out there by Greg Lehman on the overflowing cup analogy. And what, what Greg talks about there is that when the cup overflows, you have pain or a flare up. Um, and you want to have the ability for that cup to overflow because if you sprain an ankle, if you break a bone, if you do this or you do that, the overflowing cup gives you a pain response. So that way you, you end up mobilizing yourself in such a way. But in some respects, various other things can fill that cup to get you closer to almost overfilling so that the slightest thing makes you feel worse. So it could be like chemical changes in a joint, but it could be a number of things that are in your in your environment that are making that cup uh, overfill. So that's another one. So I use a lot of analogies for patients. Um, so yeah, again, YouTube videos, things like that. Um, every now and then, if I have a patient who has um, no see plastic pain, I'll give them some journal articles, or not some journal articles to read, but articles to read, things about um, resources that talk about perceptions of danger. So, um, Body and Mind has a lot of uh, resources on, on uh, perception of danger. Um, the, the book, um, uh, The Way Out by Alan Gordon talks about danger and pain quite a bit. So uh, that's something that I'm, uh, I'm really trying to pay attention to uh, as newer narratives. So that way I'm aware of them. Uh, so yeah, there, there are n number of resources that I give patients. But the other thing I do is yeah, I, I I pull up my whiteboard and I just sit there and I draw up for patients and, and they love that. And they'll just take photos of my drawings. Um, and then we'll, we'll use those as discussion points later on. Yeah. I think that's a, the easiest and simplest is making it personal and drawing on a whiteboard, like take a picture of this and then revisit this. And it's on their phone. The phones aren't going anywhere. And if they revisit it, it cues something instantaneously in the brain to change a habit, break a habit or make a habit. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I use uh, about a four to five minute video with a cruel Australian accent, uh, chronic pain and what to do with it. And uh, I just send to the patient, hey, it's five minutes, please just watch it. I'm going to send you the link, watch it, and then we'll talk about it the next session and just kind of drop it and back off a bit. A, it's a cool Australian accent. Uh, B, it kind of, it's one of those, um, like they, they draw things out like on a whiteboard, but it's, I forget the name of the actual um there's like a, a like a 
a specific uh, uh, type of video where somebody draws on their whiteboard and talks through it. And it's these really cool caricatures that they draw and all that. But it's really easy and simple for people to understand. It's a, it's a nice bridge to a conversation. Yeah, I think that um, be- let's close this down here. Yes, sir. It was done through Paint Australia. I've seen that one. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. And it's, it, again, simple hits, hits home. Um, I'll, I'll put some of those, uh, those the, the information you just gave me in the show notes here. So real quick, let's close this down. Two to three takeaways for a chronic pain patient. What do you want a chronic pain patient watching this to take away from all this information that you've dropped on us uh, uh, so far? Uh, great question. I, the, the one thing that I want chronic pain patients to, to realize is that there is always a glimmer of hope that they can improve either their life or their pain if they if they develop the the right therapeutic relationship with a patient or sorry with a, with a therapist um, that listens to them and listens to their concerns and understands their individual needs so just understanding that there's hope in in one way or another is the is the absolute primary thing um, and i don't think there's anything bigger than that yeah, especially when you mentioned, uh, you know, the the suicidal patients, uh, you, you see them more than I do with your demographic. And uh, yeah, you, it, it has to start with you have to have hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, for the clinician, flip it. What's the biggest takeaway, one to two takeaways that you want for the clinician watching this podcast? It is vitally important for you to ask the patient what their story is. All too often, there will be a clinical encounter where that patient leaves a session feeling as if they haven't been heard and they haven't been offered the opportunity to to tell their story and have someone listen to them. Um, And that leads to a real amazing therapeutic, um, therapeutic alliance that you have with the patient. And things can't be truly patient focused or patient centered, unless the clinician is actually taking an interest in who that patient is. Uh, Take a really good psychosocial history, especially, and know, know your medicine enough to understand when past medical history is actually having an impact on what's going on. Um, Go learn from other people who have skills that you don't. Working in the hospital and working with physiatry, um, you know, chiropractors and physios, physios a lot less, but chiropractors especially tend to be really insular. We tend to be lone wolves. And there are a lot of different clinicians in our profession and outside of our profession who know, know a lot of things that we don't. So being humble, understanding that if you can, if you practice the same way you do today, 10 years from now, that something's wrong. Yeah. You big need, time. You need to be learning and the narratives, the narratives that you build for patients need to be ones that are hopeful for them. And they need to be tuned to what the needs of that person are. Um, Doc, how can people find you? People have questions about chronic pain or just some of the topic. How can people find you? Thanks for giving me that opportunity. Uh, my website is drdemetri.ca, D-R-D-E-M-E-T-R-Y.ca. Um, there's kind of this, there, there's a page there now, but I'm going to be I'm going to be updating it very soon. Uh, my email address is Dimitri, so D-E-M-E-T-R-Y at the pwc.ca so it's d-e-m-e-t-r-y at the t-h-e p-w-c pain and wellness center dot c-a um i also uh have a course for clinicians called uh all aboard the pain train a chiropractor's guide to chronic pain and that is uh, a 10-hour um course uh, through RRS education. So for the clinicians uh, listening to this, especially if you're chiropractors, if you know Dr. Sean Thistle, who's been a longtime friend of mine, 
um, he really gave me the gift and the opportunity of creating a course together that's now online that we both really love. Um, and uh, we think that it's, uh, it, it's a great course and the feedback have, has been really, really good. So that's the course that I have. Um, but feel free to drop me a line anytime. Uh, I have been on a few podcasts. And you, can, you can search for them in addition to this one. Um, but uh, I, get, I get clinicians reaching out to me all the time. Uh, asking me for for my opinion or for my help, and I, I think that with uh, the gifts that I've been given and the opportunities that I've been given in my career, I, I do my level best to try and offer some measure of help whenever I can. So, yeah, all that information, including the course doctor's website, his email address, will be posted in the show notes. Please, please, if you have questions or uh, anything, this topic is so big and it impacts. His patients, my patients, United States of America, Canada, pretty much every developed country, chronic pain is a big deal. It's only becoming more of a big deal uh, as the years go by. Please reach out. Please, you know, take the extra step to, you know, uh, get in there and, and learn about the topic um, from an expert in the field, somebody who does this, lives this, breathes this every single day um, because it is too big and too important to our patient. And there's nothing like when you hear the first time, uh, you know, the patient is suicidal. It's like, oh shit, what do I do? And doc will help you hopefully navigate that spectrum. And hopefully the, your patients through his training, his knowledge and what he's imparting to us uh, won't get to that point. Cause you can, you can alter that course of that person's life. Uh, in my humble experience in 22 years of healthcare, I, I don't, I deal a little bit with chronic pain but most of my wins are the acute pain in sports medicine and acute rehabilitation. But there's nothing more satisfying than truly being able to look somebody in the eye that has chronic pain and alter the course of that life. I don't do it a lot, but when you help them, it is orders of magnitude more impactful than it is an acute sports medicine pain patient. I enjoy it, but the, the chronic pain, it's, it's just different levels. So Doc's the expert, please consult him. Uh, because he's helped me today with what he said, and he, he's able and willing to help all of you as well. Doc, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I appreciate it. Look forward to conversing sometime. Maybe we'll grab uh, a Molson sometime next time I go up visit family in Toronto. Or some Cana- That's <laughs> it. That's it. Or maybe some, some Canadian whiskey. I hear there's whiskey up in Canada. There's bourbon down here. But uh, look forward to catching up next time uh, I'm up uh, visiting family up north. Uh, Dino, I want to I want to take this opportunity to to really genuinely and wholeheartedly thank you for for giving me the opportunity to be part of this and talk to you today and you know just share some some of the knowledge that I've amassed over over my career. It's um, it is a work of passion. You you don't work with chronic pain to be rich. You you work with chronic pain and you to to learn and and to make a difference and. Um, if I can help any of the, the, the clinicians listening or any of the patients listening do a little bit more uh, and achieve a little bit more, then, um, you know, that's, that's my mission. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here with you today. Oh, well, humbly, it's the other way. We appreciate you and your time. And, uh, yeah, thank you for all you've done for your community. And thank you for educating us. And uh, I just hope that this, this podcast touches uh, the right people at the right time to uh, make a, an impact on their life. Um, Doc, we're signing off. Thank you so much. All of us. Thank you.